Um, so I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jennifer Lynn Bartlett. Um, Jennifer is the Kinnear Chair in Physics at the U.S. Naval Academy, where her research focuses on predictions of natural light available for twilight and nighttime operations. She is a trained celestial navigator who has made five training voyages with Coast Guard cadets. She is also active in history of astronomy research. Therefore, she took the Iceland spar with her on a two month Arctic voyage. I supported Jennifer's group at the US Naval Observatory for a few years before she went to the Naval Academy. One of the most challenging exercises was to ship out and retrieve, and this was to Dutch Harbor, Alaska, big pelican crates of her scientific instruments used to measure light and illuminance off of Navy ships while they were doing their cruising of the Arctic Ocean. Um, Dr. Bartlett is also one of the co-authors of Solar System Between Fire and Ice. Um, this is available at Amazon and it's a lavishly illustrated as well as carefully researched um, uh, book about um, planets and exoplanets. There's detailed appendices that provide technical data and research for your own online voyages of discovery. Jennifer is also the president of the, da the David M. Brown Planetarium in Arlington. Did I get that right, Jennifer? <laughs> um, so Jennifer's presentation segues after Dan and Sean's, John, uh, Sean Tyke's um, Iceland trip talk of, that we had in March. So without further ado, I introduce to you Jennifer Bartlett, um, with her presentation, Viking Sunstones in Saga and Science. So thanks, Thank Jennifer. You. Are we up? Yes, okay. we are. There we go. Thank you so much for inviting me. Although I'm now at the Naval Academy, I transferred there in last August. I met Cindy Schmidtlein when I was working at the Naval Observatory. As a Navy astronomer, I specialize in celestial navigation and as Cindy said, predicting the amount of natural light available for twilight and nighttime operations. She really did a wonderful job of getting my equipment to the Arctic and back. Um, when I was trying to collect data about the extreme conditions found in the far north. And as she pointed out, we were going in and out of Dutch Harbor in the Aleutians. And when Federal Express says that they will ship your stuff there in three days, they actually only get it to Anchorage. And then they subcontract it and you have no idea where it goes. <laughs> so she ran all that stuff down for me and I am very grateful. I'm also interested in the history of science and how we got to our understanding of the world. And then for fun, my family and I are medieval reenactors. So when Cindy asked me if I knew anyone in mineralogy, my first thought was really my professional network is largely astronomers or uh, some medical folks from women in science networks. But I have been fascinated by the rumors of the Viking Sunstone and Icelandic Spar. And in one of these pictures, you can see me when the Draken Harald Hargafar came to DC in 2018. And that is a recreation of a Viking longship and one of the largest currently ocean going. And the other picture is hanging, working aloft on the Coast Guard Healy when I was taking measurements of the the sky from the Arctic. And so, yes, I took stone, my own rocks with me. According to the modern legends, the Vikings were not just extraordinary seamen, raiders, and traders, but they possessed some navigational technology that was superior to that known in the surrounding cultures. And 
Part of that could be the, the longship itself, which was extremely flexible and capable of these voyages, but also the idea that they had the ability to determine their position much more accurately than their neighbors. And the tools that we have rumors of or thoughts about, but seem to have been lost to history are the sunstone and the sun, com sun compass. And both of these appear in the, um, the TV drama Vikings in the early episodes. They, they use both of those to, to get around. And so there's been a lot of speculation about what these instruments were and how these people could have made such long um, voyages. So let's start with the question of really, what is a Viking? The term Vikingur is Old Norse, and it seems to refer to pirate or someone who partakes in raiding from a ship. The origins may be from Vik, meaning bay. So these would have been the people of the bay who lurked there and then would raid other ships. In the modern Nordic, Nordic languages, Vikingar still is used in the very strict sense of pirate or seaborne raider. But I am going to use the more loose English term that broadly relates to seafaring peoples whose cultural roots were in the regions now known as Denmark, Sweden, and Norway during the 8th through the 11th century. And so this is not just the raiders and the traders, but this is the people in the homelands who um, supported those voyages and benefited from them. This is also the um, people who colonized going through um, Russia and down into the, the Baltic. Part of what makes um, defining this group so challenging is the great distances that they traveled and the numerous other cultures that they interacted with. From their homelands, which are shown here in green, they traveled west to Newfoundland, south to Rome, and east to Istanbul and Baghdad. And again, coming down through the areas that we now consider Russia. The mastery of so many of the world's waterways is part of what fuels the speculation that they may have had these additional aids to navigation beyond just really good sea lore. On the other hand, most of their sailing really was coastal. So they weren't spending a lot of time out of the side of land where you can kind of figure out where you are. And initially getting to Greenland and Canada involved being really lost <laughs> for days and like, oh, land, and it's land we haven't seen, let's check this out. And then trying to go back later and, and re, um, recreate those voyages. voyages. When they're making long trips out of the side of land, these open water voyages, much of it appears to be um, latitude sailing. That is, you get on the right latitude for your destination and you keep going until you hit land. And if you're off, then you start adjusting once you see the coastland, coastlines and understand whether you're too far north or south of where you want it to be. Getting on the right latitude line can involve knowing where you set out from and staying on it can involve knowledge of the stars and the sun. If it, those are in the right position, then you know that you are heading in the right direction and you haven't strayed too far north or south of where that you want to be. The 14th century Norse tale, Rathurus Pathir, gives our really only detailed description of using a sunstone. And the, the relevant passage reads something on the order of, the weather was thick and snowy as Sisthur had predicted. And the king summoned Sigurd and Draigar, Ranulf's sons to him. The king made people look out and they nowhere could see a clear sky. Then he asked Sigurd to tell where the sun was at that time. And he gave a clear assertion. Then the king made them fetch the solar stone 
and held it up and saw where the light radiated from the sun and thus directly verified Sithur's prediction. All right, somebody is using a sunstone. As a source of information about Viking navigation, Renos Factor, the Red Wolf Tale, has some problems. It's preserved in 14th century manuscripts, but its content may be older. While literate, the Vikings themselves did not write their own sagas or histories. They tended to use their, their runes and their language to write things like, this is mine, I made this, so-and-so raised this stone in memory of these other people and not long stories. So that the sagas that we have were written down by Christians looking back to the Viking age. And this was in the 11th and the 12th century. On the other hand, there's a lot of this material. My father notoriously tried to get out of literature in college by taking Scandinavian literature because he didn't think there was going to be that much of it. And then he discovered the sagas and well, there's a lot of it. Uh, and they're good stories. But this particular one is a highly allegorical tale about St. Olaf. And it's descript, but its description of the sunstone is fairly matter of fact. And it's kind of written as though it, the author expects that his readers will be familiar with a the sunstone. They won't need a lot of detail. We might do something similar if we were writing a story about getting lost. So we might mention that the protagonist used Google Maps, but we wouldn't bother putting in all the details about how you pull it up on your phone and you put in the search bars, et cetera, to use the app. Now, this story is the only description of the sunstone in use. There's someone who's actually using it and there's a little bit of description about holding it up to the sky. We see that church inventories and monastery listings include that they wrote down that they own stone sunstones. So there's evidence of there was something that was a real physical object that, that bore this name. The other issue we have with this story is that while it does describe using a sunstone, its description is for identifying the sun on land, not at sea. Now, the sunstones that were in monastery inventories or in church records are pretty much lost to time. We don't know what they were doing with them. We know that they had them. But there was a chunk of Icelandic spar found with navigational tools on an English ship that wrecked off the Channel Island of Alderney in 1592. So this is the, this find is the only archeological evidence of such a met mineral, and it is in a sea navigational context. But is it evidence that the use of sunstones as a navigational aid persisted into the Renaissance, but just wasn't recorded, whether it was folklore but nobody talked about it. Is it an evidence of a rediscovery of the sunstone technique that the English independently found it and used it at least briefly? Or is this a decorative object? Is it a paperweight? Something to hold down your charts when it's windy? We don't know. All we know is we've got the wreck of the ship, we've got dividers and other navig tools that are clearly used for navigation, and we've got a chunk of Iceland spar. Before we turn our attention to what minerals might be the sunstone, let's look a little bit briefly at the scientific theory of how these are used for navigation. So sunlight that passes through the atmosphere is slightly polarized. So it has some directionality associated with it that is um, results from it being scattered in the atmosphere and being reflected off other surfaces. So you can use a polarizing crystal, something with a similar property, 
And if you align it so that the polarization axis matches the polarization of the sky, then the other axis will point towards the sun. And when it's properly aligned, then the most light will get through and that will be the brightest appearance that you get looking through the stone. The stone. If you took two measurements, then you can um, cross-reference them and you should get a good idea of where the sun is both along the azimuth, along your horizon and in, in height. Certainly insects do this. They, can, they have sensors in addition to their regular vision, vision like we see light, but they can detect the polarization patterns in light. Um, on cloudy days, bees can use the polarization of the light that makes it through the clouds to get back to their food sources. And they communicate to other bees, both distance and direction, again, related to this polarization of the light. And also recent studies have found that bees can discriminate between flowers in part because the way some flowers reflect light has um, a polarization aspect to it. And so they reflect polarized light differently than the sky and from other flowers. When the Scandinavian airline system decided to, to go into great circle routes, going over the pole to cut off time and fuel costs, they started this in, their first flights were in 1952. But at that time, air navigation was still celestial navigation. This is pre-GPS, this is pre-LORAN, pre-radar, or radar was coming in. But so they want to be able to tell your position and keep on track. You're keeping track of the position of the sun and the stars, as well as beacons and the terrain. But if you're going to go over the poles, none of those aids to navigation are easily available. So to start their flights, they needed to perfect kind of three, three critical pieces of technology. And one of those was called the Fund Sky Compass. And it used polarization of sunlight to locate the sun when it was cloudy. So it had a polarizing filter in it. And it would be rotated so that a cross on it would disappear and then the device would be aligned with the sun. So this is in essence, a high-tech version of what the Vikings were allegedly doing with their sons. And I'm fairly intrigued by this sky compass, which I recently discovered records about, and I would like to see one, but I have not done, not accomplished that yet. So while we don't have a specific description of a sunstone in the sagas or what its properties might really be, we can read Ronald Spatter and um, look at Ramsku's theory that the Vikings use polarized light and assume that the mineral must be polarizing. That fits um, just kind of this description that the technique involved polarized light getting through the clouds. We can assume that it is clear or translucent so that observ observing the sunlight through it would fit the description. And we assume that it would naturally occur in the Viking homelands. Those regions are now considered Norway, Sweden, Denmark, or Iceland. Since the mentions of the so stones don't have an indication that they're rare or precious or that someone had to bring it from somewhere else. So kind of the idea that they are um, commonly occurring or easily to easily obtained. The two candidates that are most uh, re frequently mentioned are um, Corderite and Iceland Spar or in Icelandic Silverberg, the silver stone which is a particularly pure um, birefringent form of palsate.
So the picture here of the cordite shows it through different polarizing filters and the fact that the color of it appears differently when you look at it in different um, orientations of light. And then the picture, the second picture of the Icelandic spar emphasizes that it splits the light and so you get a double image. I fully confess that my knowledge of minerals and their characterizations runs pretty much to pretty rock, backyard rock. Ooh, that's a beauty rock. <laughs> um, so I am relying here heavily on the Encyclopedia of Minerals for this data. So comparison of cordite and the more generally the calcite family. Right, chemical formulas. The uh, cordite is orthorhombic, has the different axes. Calcite is tri has three equal axes. They are both freely abundant, which matches well with what we know, what we would expect for a sunstone. The calcite comes in a colorless variety. Both of them have or can come in with a vitreous or glass-like luster, and they can be um, have transparent forms. So the, the, their candidacy is based on the crystalline forms. Granular, stalactites, those are all very nice and have their, their, their uses in nature, but they're not particularly useful for our, our understanding of what a Viking sunstone might look like. The prismatic form of cordite is one of the rarer forms for that particular mineral, um, but it does occur. And here are some sources of these minerals. While the prismatic form of cordite is rare, one of the places it does turn up in is Sweden. And then the calcite we, comes from island, Iceland, the specific version that's known as Iceland spar. And then there are other forms available in, from Russia and places in, in Europe, some forms in Norway. The, so not surprisingly, Iceland spar comes from Iceland and the colonization of Iceland began in 874 under Eric the Red. And for most of recorded history, the records show that a single mine in Iceland was the primary source of this mineral. When it became a um, essential for modern industry in the 18th and 19th centuries, then sources for what we would call Iceland spar have been found in Central and South America. And probably the largest current supply is actually now from Mexico. So if you're buying Iceland spar, it's probably actually a Mexican variant. The Helgustir mine is the primary mine for um, most of history for Iceland spar in Eriksjafor, Iceland. And the map of Iceland and where Reykjavik is, Iceland is one of the places I would like to visit, but I have not had the pleasure. And the, the mine here tends to be filled with snow and accessible for most of the year, but the operations were active here until about 1924. And at that point it was largely tapped out. And so it has been a natural heritage site in Iceland since the, the late 70s. So you're no longer allowed to collect from this, this immediate region. 
the earliest evidence we have of mining here though is 17th century. So there's no evidence of it being worked in the Viking age. It doesn't mean you can't pick, someone couldn't have picked rocks up off the surrounding area or um, have carried them from elsewhere. Interestingly, Christian Huygens and Isaac Newton both use Iceland spar in their studies of light. And their efforts to explain its double refractive properties was part of what spurred their work on light. Huygens developed a wave model of light and Newton described light as being corpuscles or particles of light. Neither of their efforts were completely satisfactory in explaining why Icelandic spar would produce two images. So their theories were somewhat incomplete, but they did establish the basis of modern optics. And I was referring to their work in the last couple of weeks as my midshipmen went through their optics unit. And so we still, we still refer back to some of the ways that they um, described light and its properties. And then many scientific instruments used in the Industrial Revolution relied on Icelandic spar. It was used in polarimeters, photometers, spectrophotometers, microscopes, telescopes, cameras. And the demand was rising at the end of the 19th century. And that's just as the Icelandic, main Icelandic mine was reaching exhaustion. So there were alternative sources. Mexico remains a big source, although we're talking about hundreds of pounds being produced, not tons of minerals. Um, Edwin Lund finally invented artificial polarizing sheets and films in the 1920s. And this finally reduced the demand for Iceland spar. But even as late as World War II, the US considered Iceland spar and several similar calcites from Central and South America to be a strategic resource. We had used it in optical sites for the optical ring sites on anti-aircraft guns and on early planes, military planes. To return to our original question of whether the Vikings used Icelandic spar or some other mineral to measure polarization of the light, locate the sun and keep on track. There are literally hundreds of speculative studies of its usefulness and they cross multiple disciplines. There are biologists who've tackled this, optical engineers, astronomers, historians, and there's no consensus. I was rather surprised at the amount of scholarly literature about what I thought would be a pretty fringe topic. Those in favor of it tend to say that the Vikings could have used one of these two minerals. They do allow you to detect polarization and identify the sun at some level, even when conditions are overcast or hazy or foggy as you might expect in, in the far north, of course, crossing the North Atlantic. And so if they had access, if this could be an aid to navigation, they must have used it. Those who are opposed tend to argue that the method is crude and impractical and that there are other ways that you could obtain this information simply by simply being really good at reading the sky. And then there are studies that say that people aren't really good at reading the sky, or at least modern people aren't really good at reading the sky. And so, so it goes. I think that when you have only three inches of oak plank separating you from the North Atlantic, you take whatever tools will give you the slightest edge or just give you a sense of some control over your environment. So could they? Could Viking navigators have used the, the sunstone to find the sun when conditions were not right? Yes, certainly. At least a few navigators may have experimented with such talsums. However, it probably was not 
the crucial secret to their success is nor an essential piece of every ship's equipment. And just because they could doesn't mean they did. The evidence of the sagas for such practice is sketchy at best. And the archeological evidence for such practice during the Viking age is non-existent. So we never, never know the answer to what was the sunstone and how it was used. But thank you for joining me on this brief but safe voyage of discovery. Thank you, Jennifer. This was great. Just, just. So do we have any um, questions? I do, yes. Uh, can you hear me okay, Jennifer? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, uh, you actually did experiment this yourself when you went out on naval cruises or expeditions, did you not? Yes. And how how did you experience that? And how was your how was your explanation uh, received by the more technically uh, navigators? Well, so when I was in the Arctic, I was actually with the Coast Guard, and we are generally interested in the question of how do we see and be seen in in the far north there are a lot of extreme effect, effects with light passing through the atmosphere with refraction with cold water mirage and so we had some interesting discussions of that once you get off the pages of the traditional nautical almanac what do you rely on the i was reasonably confident of my measurements of the sun that I had located it. To do it, I would always have to practice. So before I went out, I spent some time that summer under clear conditions, making sure that I was comfortable with it. So something that uh, when I don't use regularly, I lose the skill, but that's true of many, many skills. Do, would I be comfortable enough to use it as a sun site? And I'm not sure that the precision is adequate for, I, did, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable with it as my sole source of, of sighting the sun. On the other hand, if that was the only thing I had, I would certainly fall back on it. Okay, thank you. Again. Jennifer, I have a question. What, what, what's your own view as to uh, um, whether the Vikings used sunstones and, and to get all around the, the globe? Are you pretty convinced that, that uh, Iceland spar was what they used? I, I think that it is the more likely of the two minerals. And I think that it is probable that someone played with it, that at least some of them did. I don't think that it could have been necessary. It probably wasn't widespread technology because the, the stories of it did not persist, the details. And so we have it being described in land navigation or in a land context. We don't see it being mentioned in, say, the saga of the Greenlanders talking about how they got back and forth to Greenland. Whether someone would necessarily have mentioned it becomes questionable. Again, because if it's every day, you don't necessarily talk about the details. But we have an awful lot of stories that have their basis in this period, even if they were written down later, and they don't talk about it very, they don't really talk about it in detail in, in a sea navigation concept. So that seems to me that it probably was not a fairly, it was not common if it was used, mm -hmm. but I think it could have been used. And I don't think that, I think that even if you're uncomfortable with it or it's not necessarily accurate, the idea that 
you have a backup plan or you have a talisman or an amulet that will help you out, you're good to try it. Interesting. Jennifer, I have a, think. Sure. I have a question. Um, so in your research, did you find that any other cultures, for instance, like Polynesian navigators used anything like, you know, Icelandic spar to, to polarize the light for we, as, a, as a navigating tool? They have in Oceania, you have less of the overcast issues that you have in the, the North Atlantic and the okay. Arctic. With a lot of Polynesian wayfaring is based on knowledge of things other than sun and stars, currents, tides, things like that for island hopping. But they did have some phenomenal open water voyages to get to the remote outposts that they did colonize. One of the things that is talked about is a latitude hook, which kind of is a straight piece and then a, a reed or something bent to an angle. And if the sun is in your hook or if the right star is in your hook and you're viewing it, then you know you're on your latitude line. But it's another, but it's again, it's an aid to latitude sa sailing, like the sunstone would be an aid to latitude sun latitude sailing. Okay. Get on that, get yourself oriented with where your destination is and then go straight on. So Jennifer, what, what I hold up my, my, um, prism of calcite and just scan the sky with the cloudy sky and it would be brighter where the sun is behind the clouds is, is that it okay it's going to be you're going to rotate it and move it across the sky and you'll get bright and dark periods where you get more or less light through when you have the most light coming through then you have aligned the axis of the the axis with the polarization of the sky, and that's ninety degrees from the sun. Okay. I, Cindy, uh, uh, Jennifer, I think your slide earlier, uh, when you had the lines, you did it, it did indicate, you know, when you first nailed down where the brightest part is, and then the other at 90 degrees, the other line, you know, with, that you had an arrow directional yeah, was where the sun was found. Right. So if I can get back to there. So the sun is in, in the center here behind this cloud, right? And the polarization is circular around the sun. So when you're aligned with those, with the local polarization, then one axis is aligned with the polarization and 90 degrees from that will point to the sun. A, a polarizing filter or a polarizer only allows light that is aligned with its axis of polarization through. So, because light's a wave and you'll get some stray. So it doesn't, a single polarizer, sorry, it reduces to the direction, you get the most through in the direction of the light, of the polarization axis.
so it's based upon two measurements, right? I mean, like he's what, looking here to the east and then he's looking if, to the west. If, if you want, if you want to really pinpoint the sun, then you want two positions. But if you only need, for instance, if you were trying to locate the sun for time, telling time instead of navigation, you might only need one measurement. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the sun is right next to that hill. That's about midday. Okay. Got it. Someone asked about a video. There are several YouTube videos out there. Unfortunately, I don't have one to immediately recommend, but if you um, look for Viking sunstones, there are people who are hard demonstrating it, and it doesn't really work very well in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any more questions? I see one in the chat. It says, what was the composition of the stone found with the other naval tools on the ship from the 1500s? That is Iceland, Iceland spar. That's so it's a calcite. Calcite, OK. Um, and so that, that particularly triggers the, the question of, Okay, is this the sunstone? Is that what's going on here? But again, we we have a stone, we have tools. How are they related? Is it a navigational tool? Is it a paperweight? And and since they were master navigators, I mean they had other tools as well to help them navigate probably so this is well, there's school maybe there's the idea that there is sea lore and sea lore is passed down within families and, and protected there the other tool that is discussed and has generates almost as much discussion as the sunstone is the sun compass okay. and these are discs with a with a gnomon or or a spike up in it and marks across it that could correspond to sun lines so if you were on your your latitude line and the shadow of the gnomon should fall on that arc then you would have one for the outward journey and one for the return because those would be separated by months so the sun would be at different heights and those were um stone discs is that stone or wood we have remains of discs that are interpreted in this way so there's carving but again you have the question of how was it actually used mm -hmm. But again, it fell falls in the category of it could work, so maybe it did. But again, there's not docu there's the sagas don't go into detail about how they got there. Have they ever been found in re relation, like the 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 spar and the um, and the uh, sun compass together? I no, the two the two items have not been found together. And I'm not, and I think that the context for the sun, the things that are interpreted as sun compasses is somewhat ambiguous too. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, you have my attention. So next time on a cloudy day, I'm going to take my Icelandic spar, calcite, and uh, see what I can do to, to I suggest you practice on a sunny day first. Okay, <laughs> because should I be trying to view it this way as well or just straight on?
Because you mentioned that part of it's going to turn dark. It's going, it's going to decrease. Okay. Right. You're going to get less light. Okay. So I got to tell you, so um, I do a lot of working with the youth and this is one in my uh, mineral study box. I just want to show everybody this mineral study box that I've designed. Uh, it all has the, the labels and then the specimens, but the Icelandic spar is one of the popular um, because of the double refracting in, um, index. So um, it's a neat, neat mineral for students to discover. Some people use a mark and then you get the two lines from that and wait to see where they're brightest to help um, orient them. Jennifer, is it actually darker when you've uh, got it lined up uh, because the light is bleeding off two ways because of the double refraction? Is that what's going on? In the case of I'm not sure. I have to work that out. Yeah, um, because that's not, um, that works with SPAR, but it won't work with the um, quarterite, which doesn't have the, the double refraction. So the putting the bars on it and getting them to be, to be, have similar brightness works. And that is a effect of it being double refracted, um, just allowing it to, to match the polarization and be brighter so you have more light passing through would work for either. And sounds like it'd be a lot of fun to take it outside and play with it on a cloudy day. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a really interesting presentation. Thank you. So yeah, let's all try that on a cloudy day and then write let's submit a little article for uh, Ken Rock in the newsletter. Kathy, I'm thinking of your kids, the, 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 the kids you show, and they would just love that. To Where's the sun? <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Jennifer. Don't want to return to a bunch of blind kids to their parents, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are going to be an awful lot of teachers out there soon chasing kids. <laughs> But yeah, but again, you shouldn't be point. You're not pointing it towards the sun. You're looking for the pattern yeah. in the sky. Yeah. As opposed to taking a noon sight with a sextant and then you're staring at the sun. Hopefully with filters. <laughs> yeah, but you're you're kind of talking about a really cloudy day, aren't you? That. So the level, of, you need to have enough, you, you, it will work on a cloudy day, but it can become so cloudy that you just don't get enough um, read, read off the sunlight. Um, it can be too, it can be too overclouded. And if you're practicing or playing with it, you won't, you'll probably do it on a sunny day to make sure that you have a sense of how it changes and that you've actually found the sun. Yeah, nowadays we have a lot of other cues about what time it is. I mean, I can pretty much guess and have ideas, you know, and I have an idea of how much time has passed, but there's a lot of other cues, even when I'm not around the clock, you know. So part of the speculation for people going by, there's just lots of other cues going on. But if that, you're out in the ocean on a cloudy day. So there's also thought the reason it appears in monastic records is to keep time to keep the hour, the canonical hours of prayer. <laughs> yeah. 
It's interesting. Our call through room wants to know time. Is is people and and you know how much more than just an internal clock? I understand the Lakota is you know if you call a meeting they'll turn up when it's time and it's a different sense of time and, and it takes a while for everybody to gather so you know it, certain cultures are totally obsessed with time but you would need to know that i understand uh you were talking about going over the poles and I understand during World War II, they didn't know about the winds going across, uh, you know, in the plains, and they didn't have all the right calculations and the plains would overshoot or undershoot, depending on the direction of the wind, because the wind was helping the planes up in the air or going against them. So it would be very critical to have you know, other measurement tools, which were eventually developed. That was really interesting and <laughs> what they were depending upon when they first start flying over the poles with passengers. So there was the, there was the, the sky compass, which was again used polarization to sense the sky, a gyro compass, which always points in the same direction, levels out, and then a grid system so that they could essentially treat the North Pole as though it was not in the center of, of the maps and allowed for directionality in a way that, because otherwise our kind of our definitions break down when every direction is south. Oh, okay. Because all of your longitude lines meet, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what's fun about this group. I have to think about things I haven't thought about in a long time. Basic high school math. I had to get my little dog before he uh, caused too much commotion. But thank you, Jennifer. That was a wonderful presentation. I think we really enjoyed my pleasure. it. pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. That was very kind. Thank you very much. Rocky enjoyed thank it too. <laughs>